So welcome back, everybody. And uh, so we were continuing our conversation, and, and the, the initial part of the uh, discussion this afternoon, I wanted to hear what people had to say from their own perspective and their own point of view. But sometimes it can happen that, like, you know, if we're just explaining what is our point of view, then uh, we can still remain, as somebody said, we can remain in our own box or in our own silo. And sometimes we can use an opportunity for interfaith discussion simply to promote our own religion or our own point of view. And that's not necessarily all that fruitful. So what I'd like to invite people now is to do is something a bit more reflective and to think about, well, is there some example of conflict which has been happening in a real example, real world example, might be something big or something small, but some kind of conflict that's involved your religious community and a way in which your religious community has responded to that in a skillful and positive way, but also an acceptance of something that's happened within your religious community which has maybe not been skillful or, or, or um, has not represented the best values of what your religion can offer. Uh, and so that way we can uh, acknowledge uh, something of the, uh, the duality of this. I, I might just sort of kick it off by just speaking not from a Buddhist point of view but uh, from an Australian point of view. And uh, as an Australian then, you know, I was born in Perth, brought up in this country and we are brought up to believe that this is our land and this is our house. Uh, I live on such and such a place and we own this house and this is our place. And it's only very gradually that we come to realise that actually we stole this land. And it doesn't actually really belong to us. And the people who owned it, the Aboriginal people of this land, they never gave us title of it. And their nations and their peoples are still here. And we're kind of living on their land without paying any rent. Far from paying any rent, we've we've damaged and destroyed uh, their whole culture. And uh, recently uh, with uh, Deepika and a number of the other people here, we did a retreat at Lilla, an Aboriginal community in the centre of Australia. And it was a very beautiful and powerful experience. And one of the things that really brought home to me was about how in Australia we, we, we think of ourselves as a developed country, but we're really a developed country wrapped around an undeveloped country and, or a number of undeveloped countries. And, you know, there's no doubt that we have brought many things to this country. I don't know how many of them are good. Uh, my friend Thisbe used to work on Aboriginal communities in Central Australia for many years. And she said that the Aboriginal people in the communities there said the only good thing that the white man has ever brought to Australia is a Toyota Land Cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> so at least that's something. And <laughs> so at least we've done something good. But when we see this land, it's so impoverished. If we go out here, we look at the trees, the trees, incredible trees that we can see just at the back there. And everything we can see, but our land and our bush, everything around us is so impoverished compared to what it was when the white people first arrived here. And we've done so much damage. And even staying in Lilla in Central Australia, one of the things that really shocked me there was speaking with the community member, uh, a young, young guy in his 30s, and he said when he was growing up on that community, it was so different. This is in the middle of Central Australia, just, uh, just near uh, Uluru. The grasses were different. Now these are all introduced grasses from Africa. There were so many more animals there before. The sounds at night time were different since he was a boy in the middle of Central Australia, and this is what we have done. So, what does this mean for us? It means that, for, for myself, it means that if, if, if we want to think about and move towards some kind of peace and some kind of reconciliation, we have to start with some humility, and we have to start with some self-acknowledgement, and we have to start with some realisation that we, we can't go around just fixing everybody else's problems. We have to look into ourselves and look at what are our problems first. Otherwise, we're just going to be repeating the same mistakes again and again and again. So here, I'm, I'm just speaking a bit as, as an Australian, really, rather than as a Buddhist particularly. But this is how I feel about our role here. And I'd like to ask the different people here to speak 
in, about something that has occurred to them or something that they understand that's, that's invited that sense of self-reflection and re-evaluation. So maybe I'll ask Venerable Dhammananda to, to... Are you happy to speak first as our special guest? Yeah? Sure. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to share my story, uh, my own story, which, uh, which changed my life and the way I look at the religion and then the, the, the teaching. Um, I'm from eastern part of Sri Lanka, I'm from Ampara, and uh, as part of this conflict that we had in Sri Lanka, many young people, uh, you know, they, they died, and uh, among them one was my elder brother, and uh, my elder brother was the hero, you know, in my life, and he, you know, and the losing him was so difficult for me to bear. And I was talking about healing. Uh, healing means healing from wounds. And uh, from that uh, thing, I, I understood I'm with lots of wounds. And it was not easy to cope up with that. And uh, until then, as a traditional Buddhist monk, I, I have you know, I, I knew about metta meditation, but I, I realized that it is a healing tool once I, I know, got this wound and one day, one fine day, I, I, I was, you know, practicing this meditation there. When we come to the level that developing loving kindness to the to your enemy or someone who have done harm to you. In that level, I, I know I purposely develop loving kindness. Whoever who happened to take a gun against my brother, may he or she be well, may he or she be happy. And you know, that moment I felt that, you know, I, I got rid of some pain I had in me. That was the first step that, you know, I understood that the, 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 the teaching has something to do. I mean, the meaning, unless, until then, it was something, you know, I, what I was just preaching. And the next level was, once I was in Batikulu, uh, I was part of the Mandela Dialogue Program. I was with the uh, delegation. And the morning, when we start the program, the organizers gave me a chance to you know, 20 minutes to start the program. And there I, you know, with the whole group, I practice this metta meditation, and there I add a little bit. My brother uh, faced that unfortunate incident about 40 kilometers away from this place. Please join with me, and together I guided whoever, again, whoever who happened to take a gun. I never said whoever who did this, no, whoever who happened to take a gun, because I knew no one was born to take a gun. And that day, the one activity was to go and meet. There were several activities. I selected the activity to go and meet former LTT members. And there, five members were there sitting at the other side of the table, and out of five... Sorry, sorry Venable, maybe explain who the LTTT is, for not, not everyone might understand the reference. Yeah. yeah. LTTE is the one of, I mean, military organization uh, fighting for uh, separate state for Tamil people, north and east part of Sri Lanka, they were fighting for a separate state. So that is LTT, uh, Liberation uh, Tigers for Tamil Lilam. Yes, that is the organization. And that meeting, the other side of the table, there were five ex-members of the organization, out of them two were female, former carders, and more, I mean, two of them, I think they were, you know, with limp, they came limping and with the wounds. And first time, uh, I saw my, the other as a human being. Until then, I was developing this loving kindness, whoever who happened to take a gun, there is no face, someone. Now there is someone before me. And first time, I listened to the story, and that day, I, I couldn't bear, I mean, I mean, it was very difficult for me to see my other as a human being. And to 
to hear, hear the story and what I felt, my brother is a privileged person and this girl, you know, she has gone through so much of violence. And uh, if I am to share with you, that day it was very difficult for me to bear this. And when I came to the hotel, there was a swimming pool. First time in my life, I, I dipped myself in the hair, you know, to come out of this emotion. It was so difficult for me. And, uh, and when I went to Kilinochi, Mr. Raj knows that there, uh, Tehran Kandal School, the school children, and I, I was given a chance to address them, and the principal introduced them. You know, I asked from where these people have come, and he said, these people have been living in southern part of Sri Lanka during 1983 riots. They have shifted here, I mean, came here. 1983, there was a riots, and Tamil people in the Colombo and other parts, they were attacked, organized manner. And they were sent back to, sent to northern part. And that day, until then, I have heard of the story. And today, that day, I saw people from that community. That day, I couldn't speak. I was with tears, and I said, I apologize for what happened. I did not do, I did not part, I was not part of that, but I apologize, you know, what happened. And uh, what I see, uh, based, from, based on the teaching from Buddhism, um, in Buddhism there are no sinners as such, you know, no sinners. That, that is one difference, that are, there is no sinner as such. People do uh, wrongful things because of the ignorance. And once awareness is there, that person is free from that, you know, and it is very clearly mentioned in uh, teaching that it's like the moon that came out of the cloud. Abba Mutto Chandima, as the moon came out of the uh, clouds, that will make the world beautiful. That means the Angulimala story that uh, Anguli Ahinseka was innocent child and then he became a murderer. And then Buddha intervened and changed the background, that person to be transformed into someone, and then after that, he it's like moon to, you know. So there is no sinners and big people do full things because of the ignorance. And, uh, and I, in this journey, I understood there are no terrorists. No terrorist is born. No, no child is a terrorist. You know, no terrorist in the world. Terrorist is the result. And if we confront with the result without ignoring the, 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 back, or the causes that created, it is not the approach. And uh, what I see, even now, I came from, you know, there's a tense situation in Sri Lanka. Certain Buddhist monks are, in, you know, making so much of... Uh, what I see, um, they are either, you know, they, they are confronting with the result, not with the causes. No, they do not see the whole story, but they are just reacting to the... Uh, so, um, from my ex, as you shared, you know, what you saw in Australian context that, you know, and what I see there, uh, we need to shift from the way we look at the problem that uh, being a monk, I am saying this Buddhist institution or the Buddhist monkhood, we have to go for uh, a deep uh, uh, reflection and shift. I mean, not, sh I, I mean, shift me not from, you know, to go into Buddhism and uh, from that point of view, how to, how to intervene. The governments will have military, army, and police and to do some, you know, but our role is not that, and uh, the punish, punishing someone, or you know, that is part of the government. Our, the the based on the teaching, what I see, they are they are working with the result. They are the in Angulimala story, and uh, that story comes in the Buddhist texts. 
uh, yeah, the Angulimala, during his childhood, he was innocent person, and gradually with the other people who were around him, made him to, you know, at the end, he became a murderer. And King intervened to fight with the result, but Buddha intervened to change the causes, the other, the, the, the transformation. So, from that, you know, what I see, the shift, I, what I mean is, we have to shift to, not to react to the result, but to intervene, to change the causes that make someone, you know, you know. So that is where I see uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka and all the, the you know, uh, major shift is needed. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you so much for that. And that was, that was really moving to hear how you, you, went through that process where that, that teaching which you already knew so many times and then actually to really do it and to confront with those people who had murdered your brother and, and the people. I mean, that's, that's an amazing journey to go through. Yeah. And it's such a powerful difference between the word of the religion, the word of the teaching and the actual lived reality of it. Yeah. If, if yeah, and you mentioned the cause of that cause of ignorance, such an important thing to do. And I was reminded, I just read a article, as it happened just yesterday, from uh, uh, from one of my favourite Christian commentators, Nick Cave. <laughs> do you know Nick Cave? No, you don't know Nick Cave. Nick, Nick, Nick Cave's an Australian songwriter who was one of my favourite songwriters when I was growing up. And he, he uh, I don't know if he called himself a Christian, but he frequently quotes from the Bible. A anyway, he was writing an article about, in response to a, an online attack or an online criticism. And he was, wrote back to this person and, and just quoted from the Bible, and forgive me if I'm misquoting it, but he quoted from the Bible and said, Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And this is such a, such a powerful thing for us to learn. Thank you so much for that, Venerable. Minakshi, please. Born Indian, brought up as an Indian, we had so many issues, so many invasions, 1,800 years of constant invasion. Though we got the independence 70 years before, we have to be liberated from here. Mano Mukti, it is called as. So Mano Mukti will come only if a leader is that kind of person. We can have a conversation with anyone. If the person is not listening our conversation, the whole world is doing the conversion. 1,800 years of invasion we tolerated. If we have reacted to one of the invasions, mm -hmm. we would have conquered the whole world. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. 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 <laughs> no, we didn't do. We didn't do. One of our... Uh, uh, a co-speaker was saying, rules is most important, otherwise religion go away. Sorry, it should be other way around. We have a responsibility. We are all called as human beings. We know, we should know our boundaries first. We are the lawmakers. Government has to follow that. That was the system. That was ruined 1,800 years ago in India. That is where the started. Coming to here, let us forget about that. We have so many issues till now. When, when we talk about any issue, oh, this is between you and your neighbor, neighbor country, they say. When, it, when the 9-11 thing happened, then it has become an international issue. Why this? Think of Kashmir. What happened to our Kashmiri Muslims? No one talks in the phone. Forum. What happened to our Burmese brothers, Brahmaputra brothers and sisters? 
What happened to our Dhaka people, Dhaka Hindus? Dhaka human beings, I can say. What happened? Forget about all those things. I am living here. What happened to my first generation people, aboriginals? Are we fair enough? We have rules. We have law. That law, is it applied to everyone? I'm not saying. So, what is my position? I have a temple, very simple. I have not seen any, any road that doesn't have the access to any of the religious places. But in front of my temple, I don't have an access to enter into the temple. We are talking about peace. Should we be peaceful? Or should we raise our voice? Even if we raise our voice, only there is a saying, crying child gets the milk. But we are crying, we are lobbying, but the entrance of the exit of the temple is not open. Where is the law? Where is the law? Law will not do anything unless the mindset, as the chair said, when the ignorance goes away, <coughs> then everything falls in place. We can talk hours together without entering into any other boundaries. We came here, we, we did everything. Even I visited the New Zealand. There, still Maoris can breathe. We can see the Maori language. But we haven't seen the Aboriginal language anywhere in Australia. But we, Sanskrit school people, we have done so many projects with Aboriginals. What a beautiful language they have. We belong to uh, Dharawal uh, nation. If you want to do, if you want to have a peace, learn from them. They know each and every aspect of this land. According to our history, this land is called as Hiranmayakhanda. This land is full of, they, they give the description of this land. They talk about the gold mines, they talk about the uh, diamond mines, they talk about everything. They know everything. But none of our forums have any representation from that community. Why? We can have conversation, not the conversion. Because you said, I accept you. When you are accepting me, you don't force anything on me. When, when I meet any, any of you, I don't impose anything. I say my way. You say your way, done with that. But, when it comes to Australia, I am not hearing any voices of Aboriginals. The peace has to be from, they are the original owners of this land. <coughs> so what is our rent? We need to give the rent to them. What is the rent? They have to be with us. That is why we have done lots and lots of projects. They are so afraid because we impose, we convert, we feed the bad thoughts. They know how to take care of the baby. We need not to teach. They have 50,000 years of uh, history. They know how to take care of this body. We need not to say you need to take this injection because they are the owners of this land. The same way happened with Bharata also, India also. The same way happened with Sri Lanka also. Everywhere intervention. 
intervention calling in, uh, started to intolerance. When we step into somebody's territory, we want to put our flag. So, we are not hearing their conversation. We are teaching, we are preaching, we are converting. That's it. We need to accept this one. Yes or no? Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Uh, so can I just ask for a clarification on one point? You mentioned about the Brahmaputra in, in Myanmar, in Burma. I, I don't know what you're referring to there. Can, can, you, can, you, can you clarify that for me? It is called as Brahmapura. The original name is Brahmapura. Now it is called as uh, Burma. Because the Brahm, uh, Brahma, uh, the Brahmapura, uh, the old name, we had uh, two things, two economic crops. One is a sugar cane and another one is the best paddy, paddy rice. Okay. So that is why it is called as a Brahmapura. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, why did you mention that in that context? I wasn't sure. Or, or I didn't understand. So the 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 uh, the division after the independence, division made us. They are away from us. Everything divided. It was a whole Akhanda Bharata. The one, the complete Bharata was there because of these constant invasion. So we lost our Gurukula system of education. We lost all our 54 kings. We could have waged a war. Not even one way war we waged. Well, I'll conclude with one beautiful thing. When, uh, when uh, uh, Sita was in uh, Sri Lanka, our queen, my king Rama went to Sri Lanka. King's brother started asking, oh, why can't we wage a war? We can wage a war. That is very easy. Before wage a war, let me send a treaty. What is the treaty? Matrimonial treaty. No. What is the treaty? Peace treaty. Peace treaty was sent first. That is how we entered. We don't want to fight. We didn't fight. They realized the mistake. That is the end of it. We are very happy with Sri Lanka. We never fought. We never waged a war. Conversation. So we don't want to have a conversation, whether between the parents, teacher and the student, or parents with the uh, kids. Always parents want to impose. Listen their version first. Listen. Then you can decide. Listen first. No, 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 no. You have to. You have to listen to me. No, they are your kids. If you impose, they impose. Very simple. If we want to talk about peace, listen first. That is why my history always says, Shravanam is most important. Listen. Mananam is the second one. What I'm listening, is it oh, where I have to segregate? Then Nididhyasanam. Where I have to put an end, then continue. Then prashna, then question. But we, in the first place, start with the last, prashna. <laughs> Peace will not be there. Dhanivadaha. Thank you so very much. Okay, very good. So would, would anybody else like to speak to this topic? Yes. Interestingly, we're talking about uh, peace, and we're talking about at an interfaith dialogue. In fact, one could argue that the initial breakdown of peace sometimes was caused by religions. And uh, as a Christian, I must remind everyone and recollect, there were the wars of the cross and the crusaders, when at that time, you know, a certain pope thought the whole world should be Christian. And he sent out, you know, people to wage war. It was almost thought of as a positive for you to be a fighter for the cross. 
See, the way it has been uh, researched, they've identified that religion and peace takes three perspectives. The first perspective is uh, peace by religion alone. That is where one is taught to think that your religion is the most important and therefore everything we teach you in our religion is what is peaceful. Anything else is not. The second perspective is where peace without religion. Where, now in the first perspective, there is the good and the bad. You can look at it from the positive of, of instilling, you know, uh, certain principles, humanistic principles into your thinking, or you can interpret your humanistic thinking as being opposed to someone else's. The second perspective was, like I said, where peace without religion, where if there was no religion, it was thought that there would be one less opportunity for a division or a segregation. And that would in fact bring a lot of the non-religious people into play. In fact, even now, sometimes I listen to a lot of talkback radio, and I hear this, this topic being talked about. And they said that if there was no religion in the world today, there wouldn't be half the wars there are. Right? So that is the second perspective. The third perspective is peace through religion. The first one was religion alone. The other one was peace with the third one is peace through religion. And that is where all religions recognize that they can live harmoniously and intermingle with each other because at the fundamental um, you know, foundation of every religion is is uh, goodness. We all come from, humans by definition have goodness in them. They become bad, just like was said earlier. No one is born a terrorist. No one is born racist. They become racist. They're taught that. Going to your other point about what happened to the Aborigines here. There is also similar stories where, and I remember reading, I can't remember the book, but it's a book about Africa and uh, the, 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 the way the Africans were treated. And there is this saying where someone says, you know, the white man came with his Bible and told us to put down our weapons and hold the Bible. We are still holding the Bible. The white man has taken everything else we had. Right? So, you see, religion has been used in that context as well, right? Now, as recently as a few years ago, or I wouldn't say not a few years ago, it's been happening for some time, but it only came to light a few years ago. Everything that has been happening behind the scenes in the Catholic Church, we know the years and years of, of mistreatment of certain parties, of abuse of children. Now that is a, a, a typical instance where someone in power, right, someone who was, uh, was uh, thought of to be, you know, upheld in a position of influence and power, misused that power. There too, there was an infringement of someone else's peace and someone else's space. So, and that's how I think your question started. What has happened in religion recently, which has, you know, resulted in some of these things, the breakdown of peace? And, you know, as you can see, it's caused a lot of division among even Christians and Catholics as to, uh, is, is, is this party right or that party right? It's going to courts of law. And yet, do we really see the, 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 the powers that be recognizing that they have in fact breached someone else's peace. So therefore, peace can take several perspectives, right? So a breaking of the peace or, or, or you know, having a division is not necessarily a terrorist cutting the neck of someone on a beach somewhere. Some poor kid somewhere in, in you know, the confines of a religious place 
was violated. What is the difference? Right? So therefore, it's time that even those of us who think we are, you know, very Christian should really, you know, confront those issues. Right? And, and therefore, that, that to me is the wider perspective of how peace should permeate across the world. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. Yeah, thank you. But, Dr. Sayed, would you like to, to speak to that topic? Thank you. Um, uh, we, are, we are talking about peace, of course. You know, we are looking for peace. That's why we have got this kind of forum. So obviously there is discord, there is the peace, there is disharmony. So if we, if you are looking for peace, as the topic um, goes here, is the paths or paths for peace. We need to look at the root cause of discord. So if we identify the, it's like um, treating any medical condition. You don't treat the symptom, rather you look at the uh, root cause of it and treat the cause. When you, when you look at the uh, disharmony today, it's between countries or it could be between various ethnic groups or religious groups or it could be between individuals. Um, if you if you look at what's happening around the world today, including in Sri Lanka, the crude cause, as I think, is um, a greed and um, a certain political agenda. It's not the religion that causes division. There's no religion that causes division or uh, propagates uh, any violence. Every religion preaches um, harmony and peace. But there are people who can use that in a uh, misinterpret that and lead the people astray and uh, lead them to violence to achieve their own goal. So if we are looking um, for harmony or if you are looking for the parts of peace, it is uh, very important that we give the correct message to the people. Ignorant people are very easy to be misled. And that is what um, a lot of, uh, I'm sorry to say, a lot of politicians are using that as um, to achieve their goal. And that has resulted in so much of uh, corruption and woe and hatred across the globe. And uh, it is, it is very important for us to recognize the root cause and address that uh, to um, achieve the goal of peace. I, could, I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the things that really strikes me today is you, you mentioned about how these, the, like the religions are used by, by politicians to stir up hate, and we let them, we keep voting them back in, and we seem to be really bad at choosing leaders doesn't it seem that way? We keep on electing these people to power. We, we've been given the vote, and we still keep on choosing these people to put into power. I don't understand it. Why don't we choose someone good to put into power? There's plenty of good people around. Like, literally, you could walk down the street and randomly point to somebody and put them into the parliament, and they'd probably be better than most of the people who are there. In fact, there's a, there's a, I can't remember the name, there's a theory of parliament that we should actually do that, just like choose people by lot to go into parliament. Because I, I think most of the politicians, they probably start out with a good motivation, but they get so corrupted. What, what can we do to try to get better leaders? Well, I think the major problem that we have is we do not have anyone good coming to politics. We don't have a choice. So when we go to vote, people look at the lesser evil and they vote for that. They're still evil. And so they go and become more corrupted and cause more uh, corruption. So the problem is a lack of uh, good leadership. Can I say something? When I was doing the election duty, one of our uh, uh, local person, uh, they did the wonderful job 
Everyone knows that. But they were not taking the pamphlet. I asked why. You know, you know that person very well. Aren't you going to vote for that person? No. Why? Because that person don't have any voice. So the one community, community means there is a two community here. One is settled community, physically, mentally, everywhere settled community. Another one is unsettled community. Unsettled community, they wisely think. Settled community, they think only the, for the benefit. That is where the problem is coming. Okay, so Denver, do you do you do you want to speak to that uh, topic as well? I have about 150 things to say. Ah. But to start with, I would say I would be short for this. But democracy not, not is, here, not here. You might be. <laughs> democracy is the biggest fallacy in the world. I know the white people brought democracy. I think democracy is a failed thing in all over the world. Like you, we are, we know the guys are corrupt and we elect them. Uh, we are the fools to elect them. So I don't know, but that's, that's, we can't change that now. But um, Jesus was asked about um, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, uh, he gives two parts of the one command. He can love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Secondly, love your uh, neighbors as yourself. And then he goes to give a parable about who this neighbor is. And he talks about a Pharisee. Now the Pharisee were, Pharisees were the religious Christians. Or not, they weren't Christians then. Religious people, they were well versed with the scriptures. And they were really religious. And they looked religious. They wanted to look religious too. So, and uh, the Pharisees asked this question. So, he said... There was this man, the Jew, who had, who had been caught by robbers, hit and uh, wounded on the street. And there came a priest, and probably he was busy, he had a service or something to do. He went to the other side of the road. And then came another Pharisee, and he probably would have had another job to do in his, in his service or something. He didn't do anything about him. Then came a, a, a Gentile or, or, a, or a Samaritan. Now the Samaritans and the Jews have, were in enmity. They would not talk to each other. They would not sit to, with each other because the Jews thought of them as unclean, you know, the lowest caste as we know. So this guy was going, got down from his donkey, looked after him, took him to the inn, paid them, looked after him. And then Jesus asked, who is the real neighbor? Then the Pharisee said, it was the Samaritan. Now the Samaritan, the Jew, if he was in the right mind, wouldn't even let him, in his state even, touch him. They were, you know, so, so much against each other. What I'm trying to say is, Jesus wants to tell us something. The most important thing in this world is to love God and that has to flow across. If you can't love your neighbor, you can't be called a Christian. And coming out of all these things, she said about listening. The Reverend Sir said about how he changed his thinking once he met the LTT cadres. Peace has to begin with me. We can talk about the, the, the macro effect, but we can't do much because we're little people in society. We can't change our, our parliamentaries, parliamentarians. Definitely. What can we do to change the whole system? The system is corrupt. But we can change our perspective. How do we look at another person? How we do, do we look at, at a Tamil person? How do we look at a Sinhalese person? How do we go to Tungabi while eating a Kothuruti, find a, an LTT, a, a, a person who is very militant there, she's staring at you. How do you look at that person? How do you look at a drug addict? How do you look at a person who came by boat? I hear people who are here, 
the right way coming with visas and permanent residencies and all. They look down on people who came by boat. So what are we talking about? Peace. We can't love our brother. Let alone the white people, we can't love our own brown people. So what are we talking about? Peace. If we can't love our neighbor, who is next to us? There are people who can't, who don't have food to eat today. I was in a court just to support, he of course was a white Aussie, a drug addict. I'm the only one probably who listens to him because everybody thinks he's a crazy guy. He was unfortunately put into behind bars for seven months. But there are people who need to be heard. There are people to be need, uh, who need to be touched, consoled in society around you. Sri Lankans, Indians, white people, people from other nations. How do we look at people? Do we look at them as the same as, we, we pray to God, Lord bless us. Before praying to God, look around and say, what can I do to bring peace to the people who don't have peace around us? So we tend to look at their actions, at their consequences, what they do. The LTT Khader blast bombs the people in, 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 the, in the Christian churches and Catholic churches in the, in the uh, East bombing, they blew themselves up. Have you ever thought, they, they, they were not born there, they didn't want to do that. There was some, some wrong thinking in their life. Somebody put it into them. Or probably they were born into families with a lot of trouble and problems. They don't know anything else but do that. Do we look at them at that, in that way? When I was, I was born into a religious family, at the age of 20, I was almost suicidal. I didn't have any hope. But I, I heard about Jesus and that he can change my life. I just prayed and said, Lord, come into my life. I need this now, otherwise I have no hope. And he just flipped over me, changed me. And for the last 20 plus years, or 30 plus years, I'm trying to be too young, 30 plus years, I'm serving God, and I work with these so-called scum of the earth. Drug, re, re, try to rehab drug addicts, people on the streets, migrants who are really messed up their life. Because God has put in my heart that, you know, these people, I love them so much. I died on the cross so that they can be saved. You and that guy are no different. You were messed up. I came, cleaned you up. That person has the same opportunity to be cleaned up. I'm sending you there. You be the vehicle. You be the conduit of my blessing to that person. Are we willing to be a conduit of blessing to others around us? I think then we can talk about peace. Thank you. Yeah, that's really beautiful. So th thank you all of you for, for speaking so well to that, that question. I've got, I've got a list of like 20 questions down there. We, so far we've done two, so we're not doing too badly. <laughs> But I think we've probably got enough time to do one more. And, and during the course of the afternoon, one thing that's occurred to me to ask and that maybe to, to call for a response for, from each of you is to ask uh, if you can name one thing that you've heard here today from somebody of a different faith that is valuable to you and that is a lesson that you'll take home in order to, to further peace and further your understanding of peace. Yeah? Maybe we can all speak to something that we've learnt from each other this afternoon. And if I go first, because I've got the microphone, so I get to go first. <laughs> uh, one thing that, that there's so many wonderful things were said this afternoon, but one thing that struck me was uh, that echo from, from Genesis, from the book of Genesis. He looked on, looked on the world and saw it was good. 
when God had created the world, he looked on it and he saw that it was good. And this is something which, from a Buddhist point of view, is a little bit, it's, it, it, it's not the perspective that we normally look at it, because we look, look at things as being dukkha, things that are suffering, the world is suffering. And a couple of weeks ago, I was in Sri Lanka, we were walking down the streets of Colombo, and of course, you know, in the middle of the day, it's hot and you're sweating, and I realized, having seen the news today, as hot as it is here, it's now, right now, hotter in Anchorage, Alaska than in Colombo. This is interconnection. This is the world that we live in. Right now, as we speak, we're in Australia. It's supposed to be a hot country. It's over 40 in places in Europe. This is the world we live in. This is that interconnectedness. And it's the lives that we live, right, as privileged people in a wealthy country, travelling on jet planes, living in big houses, all of the things that we think of as our right and lifestyle that is creating these kinds of issues. So that reminds me to look and to realise actually this world, when we look at the trees and the bees and the fish and the air and the water and the grass and the beetles and we look at the beautiful little birds out on the lawn here. I don't know if anyone saw the mother bird with the two tiny little cute little chicks. Unbelievable. And to look on that and say it is good. And so we have this, this, I think, this obligation, this response to look after and to take care of the world. So thank you for that, and thank you for, for giving me that, that lesson uh, this afternoon. Would somebody else like to speak to that question? I think uh, one of the most powerful things I gathered today was from the Venerable Dhammananda when he had to sit down and look across those who actually Slade is a brother. And uh, this is a lesson I learned from someone else as well who worked with me in Sydney Water Corporation. He also had to face the same situation. And I don't know, Venerable, whether you actually saw your brother being, being um, you know, killed, but this guy had to watch his brother on his knees being shot. And uh, he said, well, so it's always discussed with him, and he was a Tamil. He was a Tamil. He was part of the group. And he says, these guys killed. And uh, I, uh, a few years later, not, not too long ago, I saw him at you know, Singapore Airport, I think, and with his family. And I said, where are you going, so-and-so? And he said, I'm going back home to Sri Lanka to visit. And I said, Aren't you, uh, don't you have feelings about that place? The place that took your brother? And he said, no, it's still, you know, the place I call home. So like that, it was very interesting. So, you know, and even, you know, Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ said that. You have to forgive those that sin against you. When he was hanging on the cross, what did he say to his father? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Which comes out clearly with some of the things you said here. Because really, you know, people don't know that they're doing the wrong thing, perhaps. And how do we get that message across? How do we create that, that environment where everyone recognizes, you know, what is right and what is wrong? We may be born into certain circumstances, but we're going to face so many things going forward. And I think at the break time I was talking to someone else. We are now talking about the fourth industrial revolution, right? Where things are going to be so much different. What's going to be the barriers to peace going forward, right? In this world where there's so much data and things like that, where, you know, one government is influencing the elections in another country, perhaps, right? So we're talking of just within boundaries in Australia. Today, and we were talking of people not being able to elect good people. What happens when others are influencing that? So we're living in a very, very different world where I think peace is going to take an entirely different perspective going forward. And may I, uh, uh, I mean, 
uh, disagree with something and uh, i think yeah that's that's i think that will be the good part of the discussion disagree still uh, you know without any <laughs> yeah um what i see that uh, uh, we were discussing to go to how to have a peaceful you know how to you know and what i see um <coughs> if we identify ourselves as like something like that uh, we have been living you know as 1800 or something and we have been attacked this number of times and we never uh, did they something like that there i find there is unchanged we that kind of unchanged we is there and we and them and then i find um this is uh, there cannot be such we who are you know uh, unchanging entity or there is no such as an example um if i myself uh, you know i can say we as sri lankan have been attacked so many times but we did this way or that way and then i identify myself with a community different from the other how do we know in my genes you know how many i mean invasion comes and you know that has happened in the past and then those people have settled and marry and have children and we don't know whether my my gene contains those who invaded and at the same time those who were in the country and i, I will be someone uh, you know the and that is one second is when we see something like that we us then i think it is as an example my brother he when he introduced to me he said i am burger and now i find problem if i understand myself as we versus them how i include burger community into my community how i make peace right and uh another example myanmar that brahmaputra and then the myanmar was part of india and uh, we never something like you know after colonial period The, 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 that is how the way a certain community can say it but the problem is how, how the myanmar people say it whether they want to be part of india forget about being part of india they are fighting for uh, this state wants independence from that particular community you know so uh, i think uh, the you know the ignorance part i was talking about i i i believe this is what i was i mean ignorance and ignorance means to you know we believe certain things that comes in the historical text and then you know and if we go for dna test the result will be totally the other way and uh, now how to include i mean we versus them no we are human being and now i can deal with i can i can empathize with the burger person you are one of my brother and sister and i don't know certain lines of my people may have come as a invader maybe the other part of the as a peaceful you know so um i i i really i like to see uh, the past you know in that way and the one point that uh, why why we elect corrupt politicians <laughs> you know the my understanding is one way or the other uh, most of the people are corrupted that is why we <laughs> yeah and uh, it is very hard to accept um, you know i i travel uh, by took uh, took and taxis from the my place to the university and i see 13 kilometers every day every morning i have to travel and i see how other drivers take the space of the other how the other do not respect the other and i see a buddha image every vehicle they have with the image those you know and the those drivers they can capture small space of the other person he cannot take billions he takes small things 
and I think one of them, when they go to the parliament, they take billions. So uh, this is the reality. And uh, and thank you. And I learn. I mean, the uh, you know, disagreeing with with the smile in the face and without you know that itself is, I think, you know, the uh, learning. And thank you. I learned a lot from every one of you. And uh, this will be a journey, and Venerable Sujato, we, you know, this will be a start, you know, a journey. We will, we will go ahead, and there will be more opportunities to share and be, you know. So thank you. Uh, in the break period, uh, I was uh, discussing. I, I was just sharing some of my thoughts with. Uh, uh, Sujato, that uh, uh, what happened to the Red Indians, how they were treated, and all those things. As uh, the chair was saying, it is because of the ignorance, we have to forgive, everything is good. When inv invasion happened, we reacted at the gunpoint, three generations before everything was happening at the gunpoint. If anyone in Canada, if anyone puts the bindi, shoot at sight, order. We have waited three generations. We have given the three generations to the gunpoint. Now, there is a voice. We tolerated. So we are mixing with the tolerance, the peace, and the uh, conversation, everything here. One thing I can say, we tolerated enough. We tolerated enough. Though we have given time by time, I am I'm from Karnataka. Basically, I am a um, Tamilian by, uh, by uh, family wise. But Karnataka we settled. The whole Karnataka village was converted at gunpoint at one time. We answered them back. All our kings answered. But the generations have lost. The knowledge lost. Our treasure lost. But we are not lamenting on that. We are living happily. We have faced everything. We had that courage to come out of that one and we, we are saying yes we got a good blow we don't want to get it anymore so the ignorance as uh, the chair was saying ignorance is one part and another one was saying uh, another one person was saying in the uh, this one the uh, the uh, what is that the law he was talking about the the conscious, conscious law always happy to make the peace. But our attempt is something, our agenda is something. We work towards our agenda, not the attempt. That is where the peace is very, very, very far from us. So, I learned so many things from everyone, but we need to think in what shoes we are wearing. Am I wearing his shoes or his shoes? I can take that pain when he lo lost his brother. Can I, can I be in his heart? I can take that pain. Or can anyone take that I don't have an exit from my temple outside whom I talk to? Can you feel that one? So if, if it is, is, if that exercise can be done, definitely we can be, we can achieve peace. Dhanivadah. Um, yeah, in today's program, looking across the whole, the crowd here, that gives me a lot of hope. You've got people from different age groups, different backgrounds, and obviously from different walks of life. We are all gathered here with one purpose, looking for peace, paths for peace. So if this diverse crowd can get together, spending our uh, Saturday afternoon, 
looking for or working for or uh, looking for ways to achieve one goal of peace this reminds us there is there are a lot of people still you know amongst all these conflicts and differences you all can come together and look for peace and work towards peace and this gives me a lot of hope mm -hmm. and uh, this is a very powerful uh, message that we all as the audience um, and the organizers they all sending to the world although it's a very small um, crowd the message is very powerful even the topic when i looked at that it says paths to peace not as a path to peace it goes in plural which gives me a, 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 an impression that you know there is multiple ways to achieve this peace it's not just through uh, one religion or one theory or you know it is 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 multiple ways to achieve this peace and is a very powerful message that i get from um, the topic and also from the crowd yeah um as a whole i think there's a lot of things i get scared when you ask for one thing because i'm a preacher i don't give one thing i give a whole myriad of things and so, i know exactly what you mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one thing that i wanted to to emphasize was because the reverend says uh, draw that word the we thing uh taking the context of sri lanka um and i'm as you said the hope thing is a major thing today i'm happy i'm happy today that uh, thinking about sri lanka because um my heart is to go back to sri lanka to live in sri lanka to die in sri lanka because my heart is for sri lankans and uh, this whole v thing was always in my mind and to hear it from a buddhist uh, monk i'm so overjoyed because um in sri lanka we talk about 2500 years of history with the nose up in the air uh i'm neither a tamil nor a singhalese so i can be in the middle and you know toy with both communities so uh but what matters now is in the 21st century in 2019 we have singhalese tamils muslims moors malays anything that you can remember put it into the bag that is our demography today and uh, that is the reality that is the reality today so we what do we do with history a country without history is lost like australia does have history but the white history is bit checkered so so i'm sorry i'm not it's not of i'm not offending anybody i, I mean everybody australians would agree that but the thing is what do we do with history i think we learn from history and we take the good things and put aside the bad things somebody said like if you're building a house uh you have built a house and you go into the house and you find the flaws you find the bathroom is not right uh when you go for your uh, throne room appointments it doesn't look nice uh, or you go to the kitchen is not is too narrow or whatever so you got 150 especially the wife would do that 150 points that the house is not right but just imagine it it burned down into ashes the next time you're going to build your new house you'll obviously take note of all those flaws and you won't include those flaws into your new house you rectify all that so that's what history is history is a, a textbook for us so we look into history and say okay we did this good we'll take that that was not good we we'll put it aside that is history and let it be in the books but you know the fact is that we have all these communities today and the fact is even in our own context here in sydney we have all these communities how do we exist with these communities and the we comes into 
into play there. We are one group of people, wherever we are. We are Australians here in Sri Lanka, we are Sri Lankans. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I really like what you said there about the, the our relation to history and relation to tradition, to tradition. and <clears throat> our past. You, we should look at our past as a teacher. The no, past is not a dictator who's telling us, who's for, uh, determining the present. Our past is there's something that we can learn on and we can choose how do we want to shape our present. Yeah. It reminds me one of the first times that I learned that lesson was when I was a, a, uh, a young uh, philosophy student and I was putting on, helping to organise a conference and I was doing a panel on vegetarianism. And I had heard that one of the local Aboriginal elders, Ken Kolbung in Perth, who's very well known uh, in those days in the uh, leader of the Aboriginal community, and I heard that he was vegetarian. And uh, so I, be I became a vegetarian after reading Peter Singer. I wasn't a Buddhist at those days. After reading Peter Singer and the uh, ph philosophical arguments about vegetarianism. And I went to see Ken Kolbung and to ask him about this and, and to invite him to, to speak with me on the panel. And he, he, he said something to me that I, you know, I remember to this day. He said, he said, the reason he's a vegetarian is because of his traditional Aboriginal beliefs. He said, he's, you know, it's not because of modern philosophy or anything like that, but for he and his people, they would always look upon all living things as being their brothers, and they would never harm any of them. But in the old days, he said that they had to eat. To eat. So they had to kill the animals to eat, and they'd always apologise and ask for forgiveness from their brothers and their sisters, say, I have to feed my family. He said, but now, now I can just drive down to the grocers and buy some tofu so I don't have to kill a snake or a kangaroo anymore, so now I can change. And that is somebody who understood his tradition. And he said, he said these days, he said, some of the young Aboriginal guys, they think you can't be an Aboriginal unless you kill a kangaroo, unless you eat kangaroo and snake. He said, they don't know what they're talking about. We would never kill an animal unless we had to, to feed our family. And so to me, that's something I always bore in mind to remember about tradition. Tradition isn't something that forces us to be one way or another. It's not something that dictates us to be one way or another. It's something that teaches us. So what are the lessons that we want to learn from that tradition? It's up to us. And the choices we make based on that tradition is up to us. I wasn't going to say anything, but I just jotted down some points as I was listening to the panel, and I can't help but share my thoughts. Um, it, I sort of learned that... Uh, People who have suffered conflict are the best teachers of peace. Um, peace is not absence of conflict. Um, peace is both external and internal. They said, Ajatava, Bahidava. As I heard the word Manomukti, I remembered Nelson Mandela's words. Um, but he said when he was leaving the prison, if not for Manomukti, he'd still be a prisoner, he said. Um, I learned peace is um, having the capacity to uh, live together, to work together, and to eat together. I learned the difference of being a human and a human being. Um, I also learned the door is open to anyone who wants to walk the path of peace. Thank you for accepting our invitation, being here. It uh, means a lot to us. Um, we hope you have something to take home as well. Thank you.